FIFA 17 was the last good FIFA game. If you use the best backline trio in FIFA history with Butland, Smalling, and Bailly, or if you were watching Tass burst onto the eSports scene, or if you were raging in the first weekend league of all time, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Unfortunately, we're at the point where FIFA 17 is considered a throwback game. I mean, it was created seven years ago. Jesus Christ, that makes me sad. But it makes me even sadder that a good amount of current FIFA players probably never experienced a good FIFA, because since FIFA 17, we've had broken game after broken game. I mean, I guess FIFA 18 was okay, but like, it's, it's, it's like the middle child of FIFA's. It was just there. There were so many great things about FIFA 17, from the content in-game, to the game modes, to the gameplay, to the eSports scene. Yes, there was an actually good eSports scene where people wanted to watch the actual game and not just spam rewards in the chat. So where to even begin with this game, but I guess literally just the cover? Marco Royce, a Dortmund boy as the cover athlete? HELL YEAH! I still remember watching the FIFA 17 reveal stream with it being announced and Castro receiving a Marco Royce signed kit amazing vibes before the game even came out. And if I'm this excited about a cover, that should tell you everything you need to know. We are just getting started. The vibes of the FIFA 17 menu. Oh my god. It was so warm and inviting. An actual sunny lit pitch was behind all of the features and it made you excited to play. I've always hated the switch to the night background. It's so dark and depressing. It's crazy how just a little bit of light can make you feel better after getting your ass whooped. And if that didn't cheer you up, the soundtrack would have your back. Now, I'm not claiming FIFA 17 had the best soundtrack of all time. That belongs to either FIFA 14 or 15. But give this game its due respect, all right? Move by Saint Motel. Get Over It by Rat Boy. Love Song by Lola Coca. Painting by Louis Del Mar. Surprise Yourself by Jack Garrett. High and Low by Empire of the Sun. Youth by Glass animals, Are We Ready by Two Door Cinema Club, Shangri-La by Digitalism. For all of its flaws, FIFA has always had a great history of iconic soundtracks, and I guarantee that FIFA 17's soundtrack would be considered one of the best if it was put in a different series. Yo, I forgot Send Them Off by Bastille. This soundtrack slaps! What about the features of FIFA 17 Ultimate Team? One of the reasons it was so well liked was because of all of the firsts that were introduced. It was the first year of Foot Champs, first year of SBCs, first year of Informs being upgraded by more than one overall, first year of Dynamic Cards, first year of the Walkout animation, and the second year of Foot Draft, so it was still relatively fresh. It was a massive leap of innovation by EA, something we hardly see nowadays, and these features are still being used to this day. Yeah, yeah, so what? These are just new features, right? Is that all? No. That is absolutely not it. These were actually implemented very well. I know we kind of hate on the ones to watch for the past few iterations of FIFA, but in FIFA 17, this was brand new. And with the power curve being different, it was actually a very good concept. You see the Mbolo kit behind me? Right there? He was a one to watch card from FIFA 17. Dodie Devon? Dog. The walkout animation is still, to this day, my favorite of all time. Look at the giant flare, the flag unrolling, the anticipation was palpable. Cards were also given reasonable upgrades for their informs, and they had big boosts in the past, but now their overall got a boost too, which means they could be used more often in the new best feature of FIFA 17 squad building challenges. First of all, you had the players like you do now, the random ones that kind of just pop up every now and then. Then you also had the icon SPCs, the players during promos, all that stuff, but those SPCs weren't the ones you were interested in. No, 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 no. There were two types of SPCs everyone loved, the first being an SPC that gave out a decent pack, and you may say, oh, well, of course, everyone wants that, but let me tell you another secret about FIFA 17. Just a little bit, a little bit closer. FIFA 17's SBCs, all of them, were tradable. I just got aroused, hang on. There were none of these untradable small Electrum packs. We actually got tradable stuff for our troubles, and these packs were mixed with the best SBCs around. League SBCs. Back in FIFA 17, you'd have almost every league associated with a league SBC, and to complete the whole thing, you'd have to submit a full squad of players for each team in that league. Sounds difficult, right? Yeah. That was the point. You'd have silver and bronze players either extinct or they'd be selling for 20k. I still have nightmares about Toulouse players. But those league SBCs were typically worth it because one, the leagues were scaled appropriately so you wouldn't be spending 300k in the Portuguese league. Two, the packs were tradable as mentioned before with some really good deals. I remember Athletic Bilbao cost 7k to complete and you got a 45k, a prime gold players pack 
in return. And three, you got a decent amount of coins in an absolutely monster player once you finished a league, which then you could repeat over and over. Seriously, just go ask someone who played FIFA 17 what they think of that League SBC Suarez card, all right? That man is up there as one of the goats of the FIFA series. That was another great thing about the game. The amount of variety you saw was amazing, and I don't mean fake variety, where you have the ability to use players when they're actually bad, like basically now, but you were able to compete in foot champs with a lot of different players. I mean, hell, this squad got me top 100 in foot champs. Yes, a 66 pace center back helped me get top 100. In fact, the whole squad were ballers. And again, I have to mention one to watch on Bolo. And again, I will say, dog. Not only did you have squads like this that could compete, but you had different tiers as well throughout the FIFA community. Low tier budgets could use players like Conte and Martial and just dominate. I mean, how many times did we hear that Martial goal commentary? He's too quick for the opposition. They knew about it, but they couldn't stop him. Mid-tier budgets had the Vidal, Alaba, Boateng type triangles while high budgets could use icons and this is when in using an icon actually meant something. Just real quick, I'm going to run through a list of some overpowered players to, you know, give myself some nostalgia. See how many you can recognize. Martial, Conte, Smalling, Butland, Bailly, Renato Sanchez, Nangolan, Player of the Month Son, End of an Era Tati, End of an Era Lam, Musa, Mbolo, Player of the Month Deli Ali, Inform John Brooks, Team of the Season Snyder, Team of the Group Stage Abu Bakar, Foot Birthday Eto, Man of the Match Sao, Emenike, FBC Suarez, Inform Januzovic, Ben Arfa, Jonas, Dos, Team of the Season Gignac. I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot of players, but the point was you had a large pool of players to choose from from virtually any league in the game who could all help you in virtually any single game mode. In the end, your team was a reflection of yourself and what you liked. You could use meta cards if you wanted, or cheap beasts, or just a combination of the two. Because not only was the game more dependent on skill, but you had more game modes to just test and experiment in. And that's what we're going to be talking about next, the game modes. The weekend league was a little different than compared to now, as there were 40 games to complete in the span of 48 hours. How the hell did we do that? That was definitely too many games, at least in my opinion, but that ensured that people would actually get their very good rewards for top 100. And did I mention that, actually? If you were a top 100 player in the world, you got absolutely cracked out rewards, crazy amount of coins, four 100k packs, and 11 tradable informs. And remember, informs were a lot more usable back then, so this could result in at least 150k, and if there was a good set of informs for that particular week, you were almost guaranteed to get one of those informs as there was a minimum 81 overall. You want to know the best part about all of this? And I know people who play FIFA 17 is gonna, they're just gonna melt when I, when I say this, alright? Monthly rewards. <laughs> If you were able to get a certain amount of wins per month during foot champs, you got a set of monthly rewards. Obviously, the better you did, the better your rewards were. Now, the rewards may not seem that great on paper. It was basically a few random informs with the red foot champs card design. But again, informs were a lot more useful. And as I said before, there was an 81 overall minimum for these rewards. This also made for really fun content as the top 100 monthly rewards featured 44 gold informs and an icon. People would be getting inform Ronaldo and icon Vieira in the same pack, something worth millions of coins, and EA were also smart enough to adjust for the power curve. So Team of the Season cards would be available as red cards at the end of the month as well. Overall, Foot Champs was a solid success in its first year. However, what about the other game modes? Did FIFA 17 force you into a sweat fest like FC 24 in the previous few iterations before that? Absolutely not. There were three game modes that kept the game fairly balanced. Foot Champs, Divisions, and Online Single Match. These three things had distinct competitive levels, and so depending on what you want to do, you could choose accordingly. We already talked about Foot Champs with its 40 game weekends and pretty decent reward system, so we all know that was the ultra sweaty and competitive game mode. So then on the opposite end of the spectrum was the online single match, and that's basically exactly what it sounds like. This was for testing out new formations, new players, new tactics, or if you just wanted to relax. Obviously, again, a very very casual thing. But then we had divisions. This was essentially a combination of champs and single match, a slightly sweaty, slightly casual game mode that structure is similar to what we have today. However, FC24's version of divisions, division rivals, is completely messed up and extremely sweaty. 
So what's the difference? First of all, FIFA 17's divisions had relegation. If you somehow managed to get your way to Division 1 and it wasn't deserved, you'd be relegated back to Division 2 or even Division 3, unlike now, where you'd be subjected to hell on earth playing against Meta Rats for the next few weeks until the new season starts. Speaking of just playing Meta Rats all the time, that was not the case in FIFA 17 as different divisions could play each other. Now it wasn't completely open matchmaking like online single matches, but Division 1 players could play some people in Division 2, Division 4 could play against those in Division 3 or Division 5, it was like skill-based matchmaking in a more casual mode. The most important and the best thing, however, was that there was no win limit in FIFA 17's divisions. Typically in FC24, people will play rivals to get 7 wins and then not touch it until the next week. FIFA 17 was different. There was no win limit so you didn't have to wait a week to grind, plus you got your rewards instantly as soon as you finished that particular season. Essentially you could play as much as you wanted to for as long as you wanted to. Thankfully the rewards weren't too much which meant the game mode never got too sweaty. Making your way up to Division 1 and winning the title, meaning you got at least 23 points from a possible 30, got you 15,000 coins and an automatic spot in the Weekend League. This meant that Foot Champs rewards were much better, but if you missed out on the Weekend League, or if you just didn't have enough time to play 40 games, because who the hell actually has that kind of time, you could grind divisions during the week as much as you wanted and earn yourself some coins. Now I'm not saying these three game modes were perfect, again the Weekend League being 40 games was an absolute slog just for one weekend, let alone every single weekend. Along with that, the online single match didn't let us really work towards anything. I know it's a casual mode, but just saying, you know, play this amount of games, you get a reward, would have been nice. However, even with its flaws, this was still a decent combination of game modes, one that lets us use meta players and foot champs, and fun players in divisions in the online single matches. It also made the content given to us absolutely fantastic. And speaking of content, Jesus Christ, what a f***ing transition, huh? Content in FIFA 17 Ultimate Team was extremely balanced. Yes, we had content and various SBCs throughout the year, but there wasn't an overload of content or promos. Now stay with me here, let's count to see how many promos there are in FIFA 17, shall we? About 12, there are 12 promos or so. That gets to about one promo every four weeks, with some promos running longer to bridge the gap to the next one, like Footmiss, for example, running for about three weeks and giving three player SBCs a day. This to me at least, was very good content. Let's compare that to FIFA 23 now. Not only were there double the amount of promos, but most of the FIFA 23 promos lasted two weeks, meaning there were virtually always a promo going on. Now you may think that's a good thing, but this oversaturation of content has made us over-reliant on these promos, so now we actually have to have a promo in order to enjoy the game rather than just playing it. The quality of the promos typically got worse too. Of the 25 promos from FIFA 23, about 10 of them were useless or just not good. Compare this to the 12 promos of FIFA 17, we had about 10 of them that were fun. Movember and St. Patrick's being, you know, kind of useless. Now what about the amount of players released per promo? Well, let's, again, compare FIFA 23 and FIFA 17, shall we? Okay. Yep, 14 players, uh, 11 of them released one day, three more a few days later. Yep, uh-huh, uh-huh, yep. Oh, oh my god, oh, but look at, look at that! Look at that, oh! Oh my god, what the hell, this is so beautiful! Holy shit! Promos used to be a time of actual excitement and hype with players that were good and fun to use, but now each promo team only has about 30% of the squad being worthwhile to try out, where FIFA 17 promos had at least half of the team worth trying. Let's not forget about the selection of players that EA have been using the past couple years either. What the fuck? What the fuck? However, the biggest reason why the content succeeded and why the game overall succeeded was because the gameplay was actually halfway decent. Contrary to what too many FIFA fans think, the gameplay is always the most important part of a game. Now yes, content is important, I agree, but if the game is very fun, you wouldn't need 580 different promos to keep your attention. Now was FIFA 17's gameplay perfect? Absolutely not, no, because no FIFA gameplay is perfect. In fact, every FIFA game has one thing in common with each other, an overpowered meta. It just so happens that FIFA 17's meta was the least bad over the years. 
the low driven shot. When I compare metas, I'm thinking of the ones that require at least a little bit of skill. You have bridging, flick up crosses, running down the line, and doing a cutback. All of these require a very low amount of skill to do, contrary to the low driven. I'm not saying that the action of doing the low driven shot, which was pressing the shoot button twice like a timed finish, is difficult to do. In fact, a little monkey man could do it, it's so easy. But instead, it was getting to the area to use the low driven that actually took a little bit of skill. Now again, this was a meta mechanic, so it wasn't always perfect. Nutmegs were incredibly common and very frustrating. You could do a low driven shot from even a few yards outside of the box, and goalkeepers had goddamn stones for hands, so a lot of shots rebounded off of them for an easy tap-in. Even with all of that said, I would much rather get scored on by a rebound than by this. But let me get to the part of the gameplay that actually made it fun to play. The attacking AI. Oh my god. Oh, you guys don't even know. You have no idea. Oh my god. You know how we have that 71 depth glitch in this game where the opposition marks everyone while your own teammates stand there with their thumb up their ass? Yeah, that didn't really happen in FIFA 17 because players actually moved. I literally just downloaded FIFA 17 to show how good the movement is. Look at this. Players actually move. They look to get open. And these aren't some 99 overall players or a stacked team I'm using. This is Schalke. If you combine the directional run making from the last few years with this type of attacking AI, you'd actually have a game where players didn't fall asleep playing it. You don't have to tell your 99 positioning player who has the get in behind instruction to get in behind. Look, he just does it. He just goes into space. You think that's nice? Look at this. They make diagonal runs. They actually have a... Look at this. They make curved, curved runs. Curved runs too. It actually has dynamic run making and players don't stand still. It's so beautiful. Oh my God. I pass to my midfielder. Look at my left center mid. Low attacking work rates. Who's on stay back while attacking, but he sees all of that space that he's in, right? He makes the run, and if he didn't have 57 goddamn pace, he would be open. He does it on, him, on his own, with low attack positioning, low attacking work rates, and he's on state back while attacking, and it doesn't matter, and he still just goes anyway. Beautiful. And I don't want to hear any garbage of, oh, just use directional run making, or, oh, just use player lock instead. Those two things were added into a game because the developers were either too lazy or too stupid to program good run making even though we've had that in the past. The skill gap in FIFA comes from seeing runs being made, making the correct passes and the correct decisions, seeing the game three, four, five passes in advance, surgically carving your way through the opposition defense and slotting home a beautiful goal. These were things that FIFA 17 had in spades. You know, at least when there wasn't inconsistent gameplay going on. I said this earlier in the video, FIFA 17 was not a perfect game. Far from it, actually. If we were to compare yearly sports games to actual good video games, like Zelda Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom, Cuphead, Elden Ring, the FIFA 17 on its best day would maybe be a 7 out of 10. But for a yearly sports game made by EA Sports, that's like a goddamn 15 out of 10. This was one of the best FIFAs ever made, up there with the likes of FIFA 14. Good vibes, good content, good game modes, good ge decent gameplay. It was an experience that I wish every FIFA player could have. So I think that's where I'm gonna end the video. Please let me know if you guys enjoyed it. And if you did play FIFA 17, be sure to tell me who your goats were, your favorite players, your favorite squads down below Low because I need some nostalgia when it comes to FIFA right now. If you can, please like and subscribe. If you are new, I would very much appreciate it. And like I said, that is going to do it. And we'll see you guys later. Peace.